Okay, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the International Methods Colloquium. I'm Justin Essery, an associate professor here at Wake Forest University. Uh, thanks for being here today. I know there's nothing else going on that might attract your interest, so I appreciate you showing up. Uh, the IMC is a periodic online interactive seminar discussion on the application of quantitative statistical methodology to the social sciences, sponsored by Wake, Uni uh, Wake Forest University and also by Springer Publishing. This week's speaker is John Kane of New York University, uh, giving a talk entitled "Analyzing," or I'm sorry, "Analyze the Attentive and Bypass Bias: Mock Vignette Checks in Survey Experiments." Uh, John's talk will last between 30 and 40 minutes. After which point, we will take questions from the audience. You can ask a question using the Zoom Q&A button that appears at the bottom of your webinar window, and you may ask questions at any time during the talk. But I'm going to hold all questions until the end of the presentation. If you wish to be recognized and ask your question via audio, you can indicate this in the Q&A text box and then I'll unmute you at the appropriate time. Otherwise, I will read your question during the Q&A period. A link to John's paper and slides will be available in the Zoom webinar chat window so that you may refer to it throughout the presentation. And now I'd like to welcome John Kane to the IMC. John, welcome. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Um, and so today I'll be presenting a co-authored uh, working paper with Emil Velez and Jason Barabas entitled Analyze the Attentive and Bypass Bias, Mock Vignette Checks in Survey Experiments. Um, and so to begin with, survey experiments are a, a popular method for testing hypotheses in the social sciences and particularly in political science as well. Um, these are being increasingly conducted via online platforms. So Amazon's Mechanical Turk would be one of the most common uh, and popular ones. Uh, also Qualtrics, um, as well as Le Lucid and uh, several others. And so this is being done online increasingly rather than in the more traditional uh, laboratory uh, settings. And this isn't a surprising uh, trend because increasingly we can, we can get large samples that are adult samples, not just student samples, at a fairly low cost by uh, fielding our survey experiments online. Um, but a sometimes underappreciated uh, aspect of survey experiments is that um, their utility is really hinging upon the assumption that respondents are actually attending to the content that they are being shown. Um, and so this brings us to challenge number one of survey experiments, and, and that is inattentiveness, right? There's a major concern here. Are respondents actually being attentive to what they're being shown? Um, uh, existing research finds that inattentiveness is actually pretty substantial in online samples. So, um, you know, this is in contrast to that traditional lab, lab setting where, you know, it's probably less likely that you have respondents who are sort of asleep at their computer blindly clicking through, right? Um, online, we, we really have no idea what people are necessarily doing while they're taking these survey experiments that we've created. Um, and the statistical stakes are, are pretty, um, pretty high here because inattentiveness in expectation is going to drive down uh, treatment effects towards zero. Uh, the reason for this being that uh, treatment groups Right. Um, to the extent that you have people in a treatment group that are not actually attending to the information that is designed to treat them, right? Then those people in the treatment group will actually look more like people in the control group, right? And so the differences between treatment and control will go down. And this is, of course, our estimate of the treatment effect, right? So you'll have two groups that um, look more similar to each other because the because uh, a substantial share of people are not actually attending to the treatment. Um, the practical stakes then are that we could uh, field a study that could get surprisingly weak effects or, or even null results. Um, and this could really be due in large part to inattentiveness rather than to something being wrong with our theory, our underlying theory. And sort of to bring this home to, to many researchers who, who've uh, you know, fielded studies, Right, I fielded survey experiments online. Right, we, we go through the hard work of setting up a survey experiment, right? Designing it, laboring over word choice, right? Um, going through the IRB Institutional Review Board uh, submission process, you know, getting asked to make modifications, making those, submitting it, going back and forth until it's finally approved. Then we finalize the programming of the survey, 
and then we have to field the survey, and then we have to compensate all the respondents and check to make sure that they're actually completing it, right? Um, and then maybe even answer a few angry respondent emails who didn't like our study or for some reason or another, right? We go through all of this, and then we finally get our data, and then we, we see what's going on. We, we see if there are any big you know, control and treatment group differences, and the result is nothing, right? We, we find surprisingly weak or, or even null results. Right? And the, the question, of course, that comes to mind is why did this happen? Um, and so an important part of our, our paper is trying to emphasize, which several other previous papers have done, um, it's just emphasize that there could be multiple things going on here. Um, for one, it could be that the underlying theory is, is no good, right? In which case we wouldn't expect the treatment to have any effect on this outcome because the, the theory is correct. However, it could also be that we've done a poor job at sort of operationalizing that theoretical independent uh, variable of interest. In other words, the way in which we've instantiated values of the independent variable um, in this uh, survey experiment is just not very good. In, in other words, we haven't actually manipulated the theoretical independent variable of interest here. Um, another reason, though, could be due to, as we've been discussing, inattentiveness. This is also going to drive down uh, group uh, differences uh, between control and treatment or it could be some combination of all of the above, right? And so obviously this is, this is complex and, and researchers um, often don't have um, any additional ways of, of determining what's really going on here. So as a result, right, we don't know why we got these results. We might even then kind of abandon the project rather than sort of sinking in more time, money and effort into it. Um, so what to do then? Well. Ideally, what we'd really like is the ability to adjudicate between these different possibilities uh, with, say, an individual level measure of attentiveness to the experiment. That would help us determine, determine at least the extent to which inattentiveness might be responsible for some of these results that we're getting, or even just depressing uh, treatment effects. Right? And so there are some existing methods for this. Um, for one, there are timers, otherwise known as latency measures, that tend to be a little, uh, perhaps more popular in, in psychology than in political science, although in political science, um, they, they're used quite a bit as well. Um, and so these are timers on survey screens, um, measuring exactly how long respondents are spending on any given piece of information. Um, and so shorter is generally indicating less attention, uh, right? So if you have a paragraph of information that someone is supposed to read and you see that that person spent three seconds on that screen, they probably were not very attentive to, to those details, right? Um, another existing method for capturing this, you know, individual attentiveness uh, would be instructional manipulation checks, otherwise known as IMCs or screeners. Um, these have gotten fairly popular in political science as well. These are essentially trick questions that um, involve content that's unrelated to the experiment, and they're also unrelated to one another. So they're kind of one-off questions that have instructions embedded in them, and uh, those instructions indicate to answer this question a particular way. And if you miss that, therefore, you would be deemed inattentive, right, if you, if you don't answer it the way you were instructed to. A third method um, would be that of factual manipulation checks or FMCs. And so these are factual questions, in other words, having right or wrong answers that are asking about experimental content. And so the actual experiment you ran, these questions are appearing right after the outcome measures or after the experiment at least. Um, and uh, you are able to see if, if people are able to answer these uh, questions correctly. Did they accurately perceive information in the experiment? Um, and so uh, in a previous study uh, with Jason Barabas um, that came out last year, uh, I, I investigated the extent to which these FMCs, factual manipulation checks, um, are how they're performing and how they can be used in, in experiments. And one, and, and, and that study also was a major inspiration for this, this present study. Um, one thing that we found there that's interesting is that few studies, in, few experimental studies in, in political science, at least in the sort of uh, six of the top journals in, in political science, uh, 
Among these, only 18% of studies were um, actually employing manipulation checks. Um, and that, that number is even lower um, for you know, actually trying to get individual level attentiveness. So it's, it's pretty uncommon that researchers are even trying to assess the extent to which inattentiveness is a problem. Um, and these FMCs in particular have useful diagnostic functions. So again, we can determine the extent to which inattentiveness might be a problem. Um, because the, the correct answer can change depending upon uh, what uh, condition someone was assigned to or respondent was assigned to, we can also see if treatment assignment uh, correlates with responses to these FMCs, which is useful to see if sort of, you know, are there significant differences in, um, uh, you know, treatment assignment in terms of perceiving uh, a, a given treatment. Um, and we could also see if there are big differences in, you know, the rates at which people are answering these correctly across conditions, which can also provide us with some useful information. If a certain treatment is, is, has a weak effect, for example, you know, maybe it's because we're seeing that actually people were not perceiving what they needed to perceive here. So they have useful diagnostic functions, right? But the, the problem is this, that researchers also want to use measures like this um, to then re-estimate treatment effects. Um, via, for example, subsetting the data, you know, we're just looking at the subsample that performed well on questions like this, um, or using these measures as control variables in, in regression, or interacting these measures um, with the treatment to see if, for example, uh, treatment effects get larger um, among those who, who passed, uh, passed these questions as opposed to failed. And that brings us to the second challenge. And the second challenge is post-treatment bias. Um, because these measures are coming post-randomization and post-treatment, these measures may themselves be affected by treatment. So the timers we're using, the uh, FMCs, the screeners, if they're coming after uh, randomization, they may themselves be affected by the treatment. Um, and so, uh, conditioning on these variables and these post-treatment variables therefore threatens to de-randomize the experimental groups. And the, the point there is that, and, and what that means is that the comparison we want to make now between treatment and control for simplicity's sake might be between dissimilar groups, right? That the two groups may now differ on something other than uh, their, their treatment status. So in other words, we, we could compare those who had high manipulation check performance under one condition against those who had high manipulation check performance under a different condition, right? Now, there's no guarantee that those two groups are identical anymore, but for treatment status, um, they may differ on some other uh, observed or unobserved covariate. And so if this covariate that is responsible for um, treatment versus control imbalances if that covariate or set of covariates has a non-zero correlation with the dependent variable y, we therefore uh, obtain a biased estimate of our treatment effect, which um, of course you know, is undermining the whole point of doing a randomized experiment in the first place. So what to do now then, right? Given that post-treatment bias is a concern, but also inattentiveness is a concern. Well, the ideal would be, can we have a measure of attentiveness uh, to one's experiment that is not post-treatment. And we would say by definition, no, at least in a survey experimental setting, we generally can't gauge attentiveness to X from treatment before that treatment is actually observed. So we can't do that, but uh, is there maybe an, a, a next best alternative? And here we're arguing yes, and that we see it as being a measure of attentiveness to generally similar kinds of content as one's experiment. So often just, you know, a text-based vignette of some kind um, that occurs immediately before one's actual experiment, right? So it's before the experiment, therefore it's, it's um, you know, not going to potentially threaten uh, post or, or induce post-treatment bias. Um, and it's also occurring shortly before or immediately before, right? And we know that attentiveness fluctuates throughout the course of the survey. So having a measure that is shortly before uh, one's actual experiment could give us a good indication of the extent to which a respondent is actually attentive to your experiment. So enter then mock vignettes, which is, is the topic of, of this paper. 
Um, mock vignettes are brief vignettes, uh, again, sort of textual paragraphs um, about sort of vaguely policy related content. Um, they simulate, we think, the experiment itself. So you're exposing people to you know, broadly socio-political content, and then you're asking them follow-up questions, which is essentially the, the typical format of a survey experiment anyway, exposed to information and then have to answer follow-up questions. Again, these occur immediately before an experiment, right? So now we are not dealing with a post-treatment variable anymore. Um, the same mock vignette is viewed by all respondents. There's no randomization here. All respondents are seeing the same material and they're answering the same factual questions about uh, this material. So that brings us then to these MVCs or mock vignette checks, which are follow-up questions about the mock vignette that have only one correct answer. And so these appear on the, the screen following a mock vignette. So people aren't able to you know, return to the previous screen and look up the answer or something. They just have to answer based on what they actually attended to. Um, and uh, so here would be an example of, of a mock vignette that we use in, in the studies that I'll be discussing in a moment. Right? Respondents see um, a passage, you know, purportedly a passage from a recent magazine article. Um, and in short, basically what this is, is indicating is that um, there's a potential policy change that would, uh, a proposal that would make all federally funded research immediately available to the public. Um, and that would be a change from the current policy where federal, federally funded research could be withheld um, by publishers from the general public for up to a year, um, right? So what's important to note here is it, it's, not, it's not super long. Um, it's also, uh, it, it is you know, generally about policy, but it's not containing any you know, clear overt partisan cues or ideological cues in any way. Um, the follow-up question then, uh, the first mock vignette, and in the studies I'll be discussing, we asked three, um, but this first one would then ask, what was the topic of this magazine article that you just read? Um, and so we have six options here, and the, the uh, obvious answer is scientific research publishing. But um, in constructing these, we, we tried to essentially err on the side of um, easiness. In other words, that it should be fairly easy to answer this question as long as one paid some attention to the text. Um, so these mock vignette checks then, they enable researchers to create a pre-treatment individual level measure of attentiveness. Um, and this measure, crucially, can serve as a proxy measure of attentiveness to the actual experimental vignette, which is what we really care about, the extent to which someone was attentive to our experiment. Um, and because mock vignette checks are pre-treatment, therefore, right, we can use this measure to subset the data, perform interactions, et cetera, without risking post-treatment bias. Um, so our primary research question then uh, is, you know, if we use these in analyses, do we see that mock vignette check performance predicts larger treatment effects? And the logic here is that if attentiveness is indeed necessary for a respondent to be treated, then we should see stronger treatment effects among those who performed better on MVCs, that is, among those who were actually being attentive. Uh, so in terms of data and methods, our general design here is that um, we have uh, participants read a mock vignette. Um, we then measure attention using uh, MVCs. Uh, and then we randomly assign participants to an experimental condition. Uh, and then finally, we are asking experimental outcomes right, to the typical dependent variables uh, for a given experiment. In the LUCID study, which is the one I'll be talking about today, uh, where we had about 6,000 respondents or so, each respondent actually participated in two rounds of this. So they went through this procedure twice. And just to maybe help make this more visually apparent, right, this is the ordering here, where respondents are all going into a mock vignette, reading it, then they're asked follow-up questions on the next screen, then uh, they are uh, being randomized into one of two conditions. So for all the experiments that we replicate, we, we use a simple two condition design. Uh, and then they're going to the outcome measures for that experiment. 
Uh, in terms of data sources here, we, uh, we draw upon a variety of, of samples. We have uh, Qualtrics data, which featured uh, several quotas, uh, age, race, and region to make it uh, nationally representative on in those measures at least. Uh, we also have two different MTurk studies, and those are you know, non-probability samples, tend to skew more, more liberal and younger. Uh, we then have NORC data, which is the National Opinion Research Center. Uh, this is data from their Amerispeak omnibus survey, so that is a probability sample. Uh, and then we also have this uh, Lucid study, which also featured uh, several quotas um, to make it more nationally representative. Um, so lots of variation here in, in sampling and, and subject pools. Um, we in total have five studies in our paper with a, a total N of a little over 9,000 respondents. Um, and we replicate four published experiments. The analysis strategy here is essentially to just examine the conditional average treatment effects or CATES using a linear model that simply regresses the outcome uh, experimental outcome onto a treatment indicator, the binary treatment indicator, the MVC score. And so the MVC score in, in the case of Lucid is uh, just an additive scale that ranges from zero to three, indicating uh, the number of mock vignette checks that were answered correctly. Um, and the interaction between the binary treatment indicator and uh, the MVC score. And so here's just an overview of the, uh, of the different mock vignettes and experiments that, that we featured. Uh, in, in the Lucid study, we are randomly assigning the mock vignette. So respondents see one out of four. We, we just talked about the scientific publishing one. Uh, we also had one on uh, policy regarding uh, event licenses in a, in a particular town. Um, another one involving policies for uh, sulfur reductions and another one uh, policy change uh, having to do with the removal of hazardous plants. And so not super exciting stuff here, um, but also just not overtly political or partisan or ideological in any way. So respondents are being randomly assigned to receive one of those, and then uh, M MVC is following that. Uh, and then they are randomly assigned to an experiment. Um, and so we, we use four here, uh, four different ones, one by uh, Mullinex et al. on student loan forgiveness. So essentially, um, changing the way in which um, uh, the framing of sort of individual responsibility to pay back loans and seeing if that affects support for um, policies involving student loan forgiveness. Uh, the canonical KKK demonstration study uh, by Nelson, Clausen, and Oxley, where, you know, we're framing an upcoming KKK demonstration in terms of, you know, free speech versus um, threats to public safety and public order and seeing if that's affecting uh, support for the KKA being able to demonstrate. Uh, uh, another study by Aaron Peterson on welfare deservingness where they're essentially discussing an unemployed individual um, as being unlucky versus lazy and seeing if that changing that perception of this individual affects um, support for social welfare policies. Uh, and then finally, a, a large study by Valentino et al. on uh, immigration policy, where they're essentially varying characteristics of an, of an immigrant. Uh, and in our study, we use the specific um, race and ethnicity, as well as socioeconomic status, varying those um, to see if that affects uh, support or attitudes toward um, immigration policies. And again, in the Lucid study, we're going through this procedure twice, and no respondent can see the same mock vignette twice or, or be assigned to the same um, experiment twice. And so this figure represents the, the main results for our, our Lucid study. And so just to kind of orient everyone here, um, uh, these four panels are uh, the four mock vignettes, so four different mock vignettes, the scientific publishing, the licenses one, right? Um, so those are those four. Um, and each of the slopes represents one of the four experiments that respondents could have seen. And so those are, uh, again, the student loan, the KKK, welfare, and immigration, uh, immigration laws. Uh, 
Uh, what we see, first off, to, to point out, what one thing that becomes clear is that these all look fairly similar. So all four quadrants look, look fairly similar. And so that's a point that I'll, I'll come back to in a little bit, which is just that it didn't really matter very much uh, which mock vignette we're using. We, we tend to find very, very similar patterns across those. Um, and it didn't really matter which kind of experiment we were looking at. Uh, so uh, on the left y-axis, what these are are the uh, treatment effects. And so these are standardized to be in control group standard deviations of the dependent variable, which is to get all the, the experiments on the same scale. Um, and um, uh, on the uh, x-axis, and also we, we uh, coded the, the treatments to all run in the same direction, just for ease of sort of displaying these results. Uh, on the x-axis, we see the number of correct mock vignette checks, right? And so that will range from zero to three. And on the right y-axis, we see the average share uh, in each of these quadrants that answered X number of mock vignette checks correctly. So we can get a sense. Um, and certainly the, the mode is to answer all three correctly, but as we see, there's, there's notable variation. There. Right? And so um, what's the key takeaway here? The key takeaway is that 15 out of these 16 slopes are all upward sloping, indicating that better MVC performance is predictive of stronger observed treatment effects. Right? Treatment effects are getting stronger. That's especially so in the welfare study jumps out as being uh, pretty remarkable in terms of uh, how much the treatment effect is amplified once we begin looking at the attentive subsamples. Um, another point here is that um, at very poor MVC performance, so you know, zero MVC is correct, we're observing negligible and non-significant treatment effects, which, which makes sense. That's typically what we should see is that um, treatment effects should be very, very, very small among those who are not attending to the treatment. Um, on the other hand, among those who did really well and answered all three correctly, right, the effects are always substantial. Um, and always statistically significant. Um, we also combined uh, all of these lucid results uh, into one model. And so when combining all the results, uh, all this data into one model, uh, we find that it's zero correct mock vignette checks, which is about 20% of the sample. Um, the conditional average treatment effect or CATE is about 28% of a standard deviation. However, at three mock vignette checks correct, that number jumps up quite a bit. Uh, it jumps 2.7 times larger to being a 76% um, a standard deviation change in the outcome variable. So it's a remarkably stronger effect on average we're observing um, by analyzing the attentive. Um, and so in terms of uh, summarizing the, these key findings, we find mock vignette check scores are associated with larger uh, Kates across multiple samples and experiments. So I, I've shown you the lucid results here, um, but this is the same exact pattern that we observe in all the other data as well. In the Qualtrics sample, in the two MTurk samples, uh, and in the NORC sample, the pattern is always the same. Stronger effects observed for those who are attentive. Um, again, we find that these, these Kates are, are generally weak and non-significant among the MVC non-pastors, so those who aren't doing well but statistically and substance, substantively significant among those um, who are passing the MVC. And this is always the case. Um, importantly, a, a second question that we, we really focus on here is, you know, a, apart from being associated with larger treatment effects, is it the case that, you know, in terms of validity, MVC scores are actually correlating with other indicators of attentiveness? So I'd mentioned timers earlier. Uh, in, in, the, in the studies, and especially in the Lucid study, we had timers on every single screen. And what we find is that in, in all of our studies, higher MVC scores are predicting significantly more time spent on the mock vignettes themselves, but also on the experimental vignettes, um, also on the outcome measures of the experiments, and also on the surveys as a whole. So better performance on MVCs is associated with um, more time being spent on all these key things, including the experiment. Um, we also had FMCs appearing after the experiments, so factual manipulation checks appearing after those uh, experiments. And so in every study, higher MVC scores predict significantly higher 
um, FMC passage rates. So the change in probability as um, MVC scores uh, move from you know, lowest performance to highest performance, that change in answering um, FMCs correctly is, is anywhere between 35 and 68 percentage points, which is substantial. It's a very large change. Um, and so these kinds of results are confirming that MVC performance is a reasonable proxy, proxy for uh, attention to the experiments. Timers, these timers and FMCs are all capturing attentiveness to the experiment. Um, and so MVC performance, which is capturing attentiveness to the mock vignette, is strongly related to these. Um, we then entered uh, uh, a secondary question that, that uh, many people might, might think of and certainly we were wondering about, which is, you know, apart from whatever they can do, you know, in terms of finding stronger effects or, or correlating with other measures of attentiveness, you know, do they potentially alter treatment effects? So maybe are, you know, is adding additional text to a survey and additional questions could it maybe just result in some fatigue? Um, could it maybe you know, result in some priming of some sort and, and actually uh, alter the treatment effects beyond what we would have observed had we not used a mock vignette at all? And so to investigate this, uh, in two of the studies, the Qualtrics and Lucid studies, we randomly assigned whether or not the mock vignette and mock vignette check appeared before an experiment. Um, and so that allows us to then compare the treatment effects observed with versus without a mock vignette and mock vignette check appearing before the experiment. And so this figure here displays the difference in differences estimates. So the difference between uh, the treatment effect with, uh, with the mock vignette uh, versus without. Um, and as we can see here, um, in all of these cases, so the, the, the four different experiments across these five different studies um, in the top panel, we see that these differences are not statistically distinguishable from zero. Um, and when we do a meta-analysis estimate here, just trying to see if we, if we combine all of this, do we see a significant difference in the treatment effect uh, when we include a mock vignette? Again, it remains statistically indistinguishable from zero and negligible in terms of its magnitude. So no evidence for that there. Um, to briefly summarize, because we, we investigated a lot of a lot of things here, um, but to summarize some of these additional findings and diagnostics that we did, we find that the lucid MVC passage rates um, are typically ranging from about fifty to eighty percent, which is um, which is on par with with other measures of of attentiveness, um, and uh, also confirms that the the mock vignette checks are not overly restrictive, so it, it's not that you know. Once we want to look at the people who are performing well on these, you know, we're down to only 10% or 20% of our sample or something. There's still a sizable share um, of the sample that are answering these correctly. Um, also, as, as I kind of alluded to before with, with the, the four panel um, figure four, the mock vignettes that we're using seem to be fairly interchangeable. The, the treatment effects don't, don't differ much uh, depending on um, or, or the Kates don't differ much depending on which ones we're using. Um, and also MVC performance is str strongly correlated across rounds. So again, in that Lucid study, we had two different rounds. So we were able to see uh, how an individual performed on a mock vignette, uh, on mock vignettes uh, checks for uh, in, in the first round, and then their mock vignette check performance on a different mock vignette in the second round. And across those two rounds, there's a strong correlation here of uh, 0.6, um, indicating that attentiveness, you know, is correlating with with attentiveness, which is which is good to see as well. Um, one other concern here is that might we, because we have this sort of you know vaguely policy uh, policy related content, might we sort of be only capturing the interest of people who you know enjoy politics and and you know, reading about policy and such, right? So um, might it be that, you know, once we start looking at the attentive people, well, really now we're just looking at sort of political sophisticates or something like that. And we actually don't find evidence for that. So across all our studies, there's, there's no clear pattern that various political variables, including political interests, but also ideology and partisanship, they do not predict uh, MVC performance to any significant degree. That said, we do find a couple of um, demographic correlates, and certainly previous research has found this too. Um, 
namely two that stuck out as, as being fairly uh, consistent across the two studies, and that would be age and race. Um, but of these two, and these really were the only two that we were finding, um, they did tend to have just weak correlations with MDC performance. So for age, for example, in, in the Lucid study, um, it's correlating with MVC performance at about 0.32. Um, and uh, so it's indicating older people are tending to do a little bit better in terms of MVC performance. Um, we also find for non-white racial identification um, that that's correlating with MVC performance at negative uh, 0.17, right? So there is some correlation there. It, it's fairly consistent, but it still is, is fairly weak. Um, even further beyond that, the sample composition is not really changing very much once we subset on MVC performance. So in other words, once we're looking at high MVC performers, it's not like the sample all of a sudden is dramatically different in terms of these covariants. Um, in the example of Lucid, for uh, in that case with, with age, the um, average age uh, for the sample as a whole for Lucid was 46. Um, but when we subset on the highest performing um, respondents in terms of MVC performance, the average age changes to 49, right? So it's changing three years. Um, it, it's not a dramatic shift in the demographics of the sample as a whole. Um, also, the, the Cates that we estimated remain pretty much nearly identical as do their p-values when we control for um, interactions between the treatment and some of these demographic variables that are correlated with uh, MVC performance. So, um, you know, again, it doesn't appear, although there are some demographic patterns here, it doesn't appear to really be impacting the results in, in any major way or any uh, way that could cause concern, nor is it actually an issue of bias, right? It's just changing the um, uh, demographic makeup of our sample a bit, which may or may not be a concern, but depending on what you're um, doing. Um, we also investigated whether having sort of this simple linear multiplicative model where it's, you know, a, a linear interaction between treatment and MVC performance, whether that's justified. And so we looked into this, and we didn't find any, any tendency for, um, for this to be nonlinear. So, so we believe that uh, investigating this as multiplicative model should be um, fine. Um, in our LUCID study, we don't find a big difference in effects with the MV shortly before versus immediately before um, our experiments. So we had some ability to investigate this. We still believe that ultimately immediately before is better, but in terms of just our design, uh, we didn't get to test this, you know, too dramatically. Um, we didn't have anything, you know, appearing 10 minutes before a survey or experiment or something where we could really test this, but um, we only found weak evidence that immediately versus shortly before actually makes a difference. Um, importantly too, uh, the test statistics, so since we're using regression here, the test statistics do not necessarily decline as we start analyzing more attentive subsamples. Um, so uh, what's going on, you know, we might worry that once we start looking at more attentive people, right, our, our sample size is therefore going down uh, and we, we experience a loss in statistical power. Um, but it's not necessarily the, the case that uh, T statistics change very much. And part of the reason is that the larger treatment effect that we observe helps to compensate and offset um, that decrease in sample size. So researchers aren't necessarily doomed uh, to get null results or something once they start looking at um, more attentive subjects. Um, we offer researchers a, a handful of pre-tested MVs and MVCs here. Uh, and for each of these, we, we you know, uh, feature the text, of course, of all of these, um, and also passage rates, the reading time, uh, measures of complexity, um, IRT analyses of MVC difficulty and discrimination parameters. Uh, we have all of that in the study. So in, in conclusion then, mock vignette checks we think uh, serve as a tool for gauging attentiveness uh, that one can serve as a proxy for respondent attention during the actual experiment and that also does not risk introducing post-treatment bias. Um, we find, uh, as we showed, that MVC performance is predicting larger uh, cates and also uh, correlates pretty strongly with other measures of attention. And this is important because um, it, examining whether effects are stronger at higher MVC performance allows for a hypothesis test that's more robust to inattentiveness. So as I mentioned at the beginning, 
right? Uh, treatment effects are going to be biased downward towards zero to the extent that there is inattentiveness. Um, and so the deck is sort of stacked against you if, if the sample is fairly inattentive. This enables you a way to investigate the intention to treat effect, the ITT, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, among those who, who are actually being attentive. So we do recommend that researchers always report the ITT first, just out of full transparency. Um, but that said, right, finding a stronger effect among those who are attentive would constitute stronger evidence for one's hypothesis. And alternatively, if you find a treatment effect to be weak um, for the sample as a whole, and among those who are more attentive, the problem is likely, uh, so this is useful information because the problem is less uh, likely to be about inattentiveness and more likely to be about theory or how we've operationalized that independent variable, which we could also investigate with a, a manip manipulation check. So combining these methods, we, we can get a lot more out of our studies. Um, we think that these are ideal for uh, vignette-based survey experiments, but still potentially useful for other types of experiments where um, we really need respondents to be at attentive in order for treatments to be efficacious. Um, other techniques, uh, instructional manipulation checks, as well as instrumental variable techniques that try to um, uh, estimate the complier average causal effect. Um, these are other possible techniques that it should be said are still not used very widely in political science. Um, uh, but even still, they're not mutually exclusive to our method. It could be used in conjunction with our method. Um, and so while no measure of attentiveness is, is perfect, uh, what we would, you know, there's still going to be some measurement error here, just inevitably with any kind of measure of attentiveness. The key point is that it's far better than not accounting for inattentiveness at all. Um, the point is that accounting for this, right, helps us get the most out of our experimental data, right? You don't have to simply settle for the ITT, kind of crossing your fingers that it works out. Right, you can go beyond the ITT and really get a better sense of um, understanding why you are getting the results you're getting and potentially whether you might actually have stronger evidence for your hypothesis among those who actually attended to your treatment. And this again is, is a crucial factor in survey experiments. In short, you don't have to let inattentiveness ruin your treatment effects, you can do better. So thank you very much. I, I really look forward to hearing any comments that you have and, and feedback. Uh, again, thanks. Thank you very much, John, for that presentation. Uh, at this point, uh, John Kane is available to take questions from the audience. You can ask a question using the Zoom Q&A button that appears at the bottom of your webinar window. If you wish to be recognized and ask your question via audio, uh, just indicate that in the Q&A text box and I can unmute you. Uh, otherwise, I will just read your question uh, out of the Q&A box. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and we already have a few uh, questions uh, queued up, so I'm just going to go ahead and start with those. Sure. Uh, uh, Thomas Ball asked, uh, isn't non-response the biggest issue with survey studies today? Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, uh, I, I guess I would separate those two things. So I mean, non-response, I mean, if, you, if you've been paying attention to uh, the election and, and sort of how off some of these polls were, you inevitably get into um, survey non-response. If I'm understanding your question correctly, um, you know, trying to get people to take your survey and, and they just aren't, right, um, is one problem. But I, I would separate that from... Um, you know, what we're really looking at is once you have your sample, right, some share of that sample is probably going to be inattentive. And if you don't do anything about that, um, you know, you run the risk of, of having weaker results than you otherwise might have. So, um, yeah, we're sort of sidestepping the question of, you know, how are you getting respondents and how are they being uh, recruited? Um, and, you know, how are we getting probability samples? And all of that stuff is, is important, but I'd, I'd say that's more in the realm of how you're actually getting your sample rather than once you have your sample, uh, what are you going to do about inattentiveness, which is more of what we're looking at. Um, Emily Thorson asked, uh, well, first says, thanks, this was great. Uh, then asks, what's your sense of the optimal number of uh, MVCs, as assuming we take the additive scale approach on page 15 of the paper? 
Um, so as best we can tell, uh, we, we did some IRT analyses that are in the supplemental appendix. Um, and I think, I, I think the sort of the, you know, ideally uh, three uh, is great if you can do it, but you know, there are depending on, um, you know, the amount of space that you might have for questions and how long you want the survey to be. We find that the, the bigger sort of bang for the buck is, is going from one to two and that two might be sufficient um, if you can't use all three. Um, just even having two is, uh, is pretty good and certainly far better than one. But one still gets you pretty far and we have several experiments that, um, uh, that I didn't cover, but the MTurk uh, experiment in Qualtrics where we only asked one. And I mean, we're, we're still seeing stronger effects among those who entered that one correctly. Um, but uh, you get, I think, a, a, a a sizable jump in in precision once you're able to ask two, um, and if you can ask three, that's even better. Although you know the the um, the bang for the buck might might go uh, down a little bit, um, but still ideal if you can. Just as a follow up on on my own, um, is it wise if you have a long instrument to mix these into the middle because attentiveness at the beginning may not indicate attentiveness at the end if it's a long survey. Yeah, it's it's a good question, and um, it, it's something that we could probably explore in in other studies as well. But remember, kind of the the goal here, the sort of holy grail, is we want to know how attentive someone is to our experiment, right? So um, so it's not just you know should we do it in the middle where maybe you know or or toward the beginning or end. I would kind of say, do it wherever your experiment is located. You know, if you were, if it's a large survey, maybe that you know you're doing with multiple uh, researchers or something, and you want to include these, you'd include them just before your experiment, ideally. That doesn't mean, as I kind of hinted at before, it it doesn't mean that if you were to include them at the beginning or, as you said, in in the middle. Um, that th they wouldn't be effective. I, I think that they still would. You want to be conscious that they're still pre-treatment, right? Because that, that's half the point of this whole thing is that they're occurring before uh, randomization into, um, into the experimental conditions. But as long as they're occurring before, I, I would say you should try to get them as close to your experiment as possible. Because again, you're trying to get a proxy for how attentive someone was to your experiment. Yeah, I do kind of wonder on these big cooperative studies like the CCES or something, um, if everyone starts doing this, is every respondent going to have to answer like 71 <laughs> mock vignettes? Because every single experiment's like, oh, <laughs> what was this article? Yes. About? Yes. Uh, no. And it's, that's a good question. Um, you know, could potentially it be asked at the beginning and then you're essentially, you know, randomizing which experiment comes next so then you know every researcher essentially has is benefiting equally from from the mock vignette check being asked in in the beginning mm -hmm. um, but yes yeah, certainly it, it would be agonizing from the respondents perspective to be answering you know 75 mock vignette <laughs> checks or something just so that there's a boring article about happen. you know coal extraction or whatever yeah um yes yeah so um I want to move on to some other questions to make sure we get to these. Um, uh, Soren Jordan yeah. asks, uh, do you think the effect of mock vignettes on average treatment effects will be different for treatments that are more factual, like priming, uh, and therefore memorizable for respondents who are paying more attention after the mock vignette versus treatments that are more um, emotional? That's interesting. Yeah. Um, and so hi, so I uh, you know we've met before in the past. So hi, thanks for it's a really good question. Um, you know, we didn't, it, it's an interesting uh, idea and may, maybe looking at, you know, could we get any leverage on that based on the experiments that, that we've done? Like, do we see any differences for more kind of like experiments that maybe were a little bit more emotional? Um, my gut instinct would be that it, it shouldn't make all that much of a difference um, because the key is that someone was attending to it. So whether it was something that is really just supposed to be kind of memorizable 
um, you know, hard information like this is the unemployment rate or something like that versus something that is, you know, more emotionally provocative. Um, the key is that we're attending to it. And, and we're talking about text here. Another question would be like, if you're using something to affect an emotional response that's very visual in nature um, or even audio or something, that's a separate question and, and one that we may not be able to speak to. But at least if it's something that um, the only reason that the person should be affected by this, or, or I should say a key prerequisite for a person being affected by this content, whether it's more sort of cognitively or you know emotionally, if you're willing to separate those, um, the key prerequisite <clears throat> is that they're attending to it. So I don't, I wouldn't expect you to observe huge differences, but it's certainly a good question for, for future research, I think. So thank you. I, I kind of have, um, I, I guess this is a broadly related question, which is um, when we're thinking about the treatment effects of some sort of experiment, uh, and we're interested in the average treatment effect on a population, aren't we, um, don't we need to include the fact, or don't we need to account for the fact that uh, many of the people in our study who would actually be the target of this intervention in their daily lives may or may not actually be attentive to the intervention in that context as well. Uh, in other words, you know, just a sort of a silly example, if we say, oh, you know, we want to look at the effectiveness of a, you know, a, an anti-litter uh, uh, advertising campaign, we need to actually account for the fact that most people don't look at it, right? Um, yeah. If we only focus on those who do, we're going to get an exaggerated sense of how, how good it is. Yeah, and so th this is a really, really good question. Um, and for, from uh, experimentalists that I, I've talked to, um, I, I kind of always felt this way, but it, it was reassuring to hear some others say this, which is um, basically uh, we, we uh, don't necessarily uh, – care, or at least most researchers, the, the point of the survey experiment is not really to determine what the effect would be in the general population. Um, and certainly some studies, in, including a study by uh, co-author Jason Barabas, you know, it investigates these differences between survey and, and um, you know, actual field studies and finds big differences. I think the, the survey experimentalist typically knows that these will be stronger effects um, than what we observe in in the real world, just because of, you know, we, we have, for the most part, people are attending to this information in a way, and it's a, it's a complete format that is very different from how they would experience this in the real world. So I think what they do is they err on the side of, we're not trying to estimate how effective this would be in the general population. We're really trying to test a theory here. And so um, if we can actually look at people who attended to it, we want to at least get to a point where we could say, you know, given that you're attentive to this kind of information, all else equal, this is how we think it would affect you. Um, in the real world where there's a million other things happening, including inattentiveness, right? Um, we, we don't necessarily know. Uh, but I think that the, the typical survey experimentalist is, is less concerned about the, the real world treatment effect estimate and more concerned with, is there any evidence for this particular theory? Mm -hmm. if, uh, if again, true. also kind of related, um, the, a question from uh, Claretta Traeger, uh, is it possible that the mock vignettes are actually increasing, and I would even add to that, maybe decreasing attentiveness? So in other words, does the mock vignette cause a change in attentiveness? In the subject, and if so, how does that affect longer treatments? Interesting. So, um, yeah. So, what I would say there, and, and this is kind of why we uh, delved into that analysis of examining the, the treatment effects with versus without the mock vignettes, because there could be a few things going on here. And the way that you put that is is really nice, which is that you know by measuring attentiveness, we are affecting attentiveness. But if that were truly the case, at least to, to a large degree, where people get the sense that they are um, you know, being checked for attentiveness, um, we might then expect them to be much more attentive in the actual experiment, right? And then if that is true, treatment effects should be larger, right? So 
if that were the case, we should have seen when we when we did those difference in difference estimates, we should have seen that having a Makinia check before the experiment versus nothing before should have had a, a much larger treatment effect. But we don't really see it. Um, so it, it may be the case that it is increasing attentiveness a little bit. I'd probably err on the side of, uh, for the most part, the people who are going to be inattentive to all of this probably don't care. And they're just they're cycling through it or you know they, they don't necessarily care it doesn't even occur to them that they have to answer this sincerely or something um but uh but yeah so so that would be my thinking is that um if it were actually the case that we are substantially increasing attentiveness just by including these we should have seen much larger uh we should have seen big differences uh for when the knock is included versus when it's excluded and and we don't really I think we have time for uh, one more question. Um, I'm thinking about reviewers who will, despite your evidence to the contrary, claim that the policy-related vignette interacted with the treatment somehow to bias results. Mm -hmm. Have you tried using something that's completely unrelated, like, and the, the question uh, the questioner asks maybe about the Great British Baking Show? <laughs> uh, so, so this certainly came up. Um, uh, as we are writing this study as, as well. Um, and it's a question of, you know, does it even need to be policy related? Um, what I would first say is that, um, again, uh, I would say that it, there's no, A, there's no risk of statistical bias here in terms of the treatment effect because this is all occurring pre-randomization. Um, but if what you mean is that it might be sort of inflating effects or something because it's priming policy related considerations. Again, I, I would refer back to that slide where we covered those difference and differences estimates. And we just don't find a big difference between treatment effects when there was a mock vignette and treatment effects when there wasn't. Um, so there's, there's not much evidence there that uh, including these is actually um, affecting the treatment effects in, in any way. Um, that, that all said, right? Um, Theoretically, the idea is that we want to have a measure of how people will attend to our experiments. And since we're in political science, we're thinking, what does a usual survey experiment look like? It involves some socio-political content. And so that's why the mock vignettes are constructed in the way they are. That said, you could certainly you know, explore, do we observe any major differences if we ask about a, a baking show or really anything that just requires some level of attention to details. And indeed, you might be able to recover uh, similar similar results using that. Um, we're not sure, you know, we we wanted to basically make it on, on theoretical grounds that this makes the most sense to do. But empirically, sure, uh, you, you could potentially observe very similar effects if you were to ask about virtually anything that requires some degree of reading reading and comprehension and uh, attentiveness. Well, we're at one o'clock, so I'd like to uh, thank uh, John Kane for being our presenter this week. I want to remind everyone that the presentation will be posted to our website shortly after this broadcast if you'd like to share it with a colleague or watch it again later. I also want to invite you to join us, uh, and I believe this is actually on Friday, December 4th, uh, when we will host a talk by Nicole Pashley from the Department of Statistics at Rutgers University. Uh, please see our website, www.methods-colloquium.com, to get more information about this talk. John, thanks very much for, uh, for giving your talk today. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. See you next time.